Well, it's such an honor to be joined today by Dr. John Walton. John, thank you so much for taking time out of your sabbatical. Uh, you know, you've just, we were talking beforehand, I know you're doing a bit of writing. Um, hopefully you're getting to actually get some well-deserved rest in, in the midst of all this. Probably not a whole lot. Just <laughs> trying to hammer away at the writing. Do you, uh, do you manage rest well? Or are you the, the type that goes, my kind of resting is research and writing? No, actually, um, I've, I've never had the habit of doing my professional work at home. And I set limits for my time in my office. So, um, you know, I, I tend to be a morning person. So right now on sabbatical, I'm working eight hour days, but it's from six to two. Hmm. And that way I get a little bit of you know, relaxation in the latter part of the day um, and get my writing done kind of early in the morning. Nobody's around and uh, I get a lot accomplished. Oh, that's nice. When are you back in the classroom? Uh, in the fall. Or in theory, in the classroom. Yes. You know. Let's hope. Yeah, let's hope. We're getting we're getting there. Well, John, I'm really curious. Um, lots of listeners, regular listeners program are familiar with your name. I've used your work in all sorts of areas, whether it's been talking about, um, you know, d difficult sections of Genesis or the book of Job in particular. But a lot of people who are not academics have got have got to wonder what in the world would draw somebody to be an Old Testament scholar? I mean, is that something you dreamt of doing as a kid? What were some of the things that shaped your desires to, to head in this direction with your life? That's a great question. And part of it, I don't really know the answer to. I was raised in a Christian home, and we were really steeped in the Bible from early on. Uh, that means that through no efforts of my own, we learned Bible thoroughly and well. And of course, for that, it means a lot of sort of the trivia of the Bible. You know, when you're growing up, you're still learning names and places and facts and things of that sort, which really, you know, the Bible's a lot more than that, of course. But that's that's kind of where you start. And so I had that kind of very much a part of my upbringing. Now, of course, as you know, as everybody knows, there's a whole lot more trivia in the Old Testament than in the New Testament. You've got plenty of more names and all of those things. And so I sort of, you know, moved in that direction uh, for my interest, because at that level of study, you know, there was a lot of information and I, I was pretty good at it, not because I had great academic promise, but because I was just inundated with it in my upbringing. Now, so I, I always liked Old Testament. You know, and that's my best explanation of what's going on, you know, trying to look back <laughs> into my kid head, you know, but I always liked Old Testament. But here's the thing. I never thought of it as a vocation. You know, in the church scenario I grew up in, you know, if you're really interested in Bible, you're going to be a pastor or a missionary, you know, that's it, right? uh, yeah. yeah. And so and I, I really never had any sense that I had a calling in either of those directions. And so I just figured, well, I like Old Testament. I'm pretty good at Old Testament. But, you know, I went to college as a business major, <laughs> economics mm. and accounting, just because the vocational test told me I should do that. And I didn't have any better ideas. <laughs> so I never thought of Old Testament as an academic career. I didn't grow up with kind of an idea that I want to be a teacher or I want to be an academic. I wouldn't have thought of myself in those terms. In fact, as my parents would have readily pointed out often, I was an underachiever academically in my schooling. And that lasted into my early college years. Uh, so I, I never had that kind of idea that I was going to be a teacher or an academic. Uh, that all changed in my college years when, um, as I kind of was thinking through my options once I graduated, that I finally said, you know, I don't think I want to be an accountant. <laughs> I'm just, I, I'm just, you know, and I had had enough uh, experience in, you know, retreats and Bible conferences. I, I knew the routine, you know, let's do the inventory. What are your passions? What are your gifts? You know, think about. And so there I was saying, OK, Lord, so this isn't this isn't clicking for me, but I don't know what else to do. 
So let me see, passions, gifts. Um, well, I really love the Old Testament, but there's really nothing you can do with the Old Testament, you know, unless you're going <laughs> to teach it or something. <laughs> oh, I never thought of that. I could teach it. Oh, I would love to do that. You know, some people come to those life-changing moments after a week of prayer and fasting and a, a retreat. And it took about five minutes, you know, <laughs> for that. So you didn't, he, he didn't head happen. out into the wilderness or yeah. anything? No, or, no. I, I fasted the entire five minutes, so I want you to know. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so holy. <laughs> but so my direction changed just immediately. And um, so uh, I began taking Hebrew and Greek and then went on to a master's program in Old Testament and on to PhD and, you know, never looked back. So well, it really incredible. was a very, very interesting kind of fulcrum point in my life that suddenly what I had unknowingly, inadvertently been prepared for all along suddenly took a new direction. Well, I'm sure you would have made an excellent accountant as yeah. well, but I, I'm personally very grateful that you <laughs> chose a different path. And I know there's millions of other people, well, maybe if not millions, at least tens of thousands of people out there. <laughs> well, you know, people glad. can have a, an appreciation of creative exegesis. They don't really like creative accounting. Yeah, just well, that's, right. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Well, let's say, you know, let's say, John, I come from this Christian tradition, like similar to what it sounds like you grew up in. Mm -hmm. um, that, yeah. that really takes seriously the infallibility of Scripture. We'll use words maybe like infallibility or inerrant, and so we, we take the Scriptures very, very seriously. And not just that, let's say I come from a tradition that not only affirms that, but we talk about things, champion things like the plain reading of Scripture. And then one day, someone hands me a book from this Old Testament professor, right? And I open it up, and I'm, I'm surprised to find out that this Old Testament professor is challenging my notions that I could just open up Genesis 1, I could bring whatever questions I had to the text, and that those questions weren't inspired in and of themselves. So, Old Testament professor John Walton, why do you frequently start your books? I've read several of them. You, you frequently seem to start your books by challenging people's presuppositions about how they read the Bible. Why do you do that? Well, it all starts with accountability. When we read Scripture, if we consider it authoritative, and I certainly do, authority carries the implication of accountability. And so I ask the question, who am I accountable to? And of course, the most obvious and most important answer is God. I'm accountable to God because this is his communication. But the fact is, God has not communicated straight into my brain. God used a different process. He used human instruments, human language, human culture, human literature. And he communicated through those human instruments to the broad, wide world, including me. Therefore, my accountability to God has to begin with my accountability to those instruments that he used. If he used that mechanism, I have to respect that mechanism. Okay, so I'm accountable to the authors and what they intended to say, because that's capturing what God's message is. When we talk about inspiration, we are indicating that the Holy Spirit vouchsafed that that transition between God and the text that these human instruments produced. So I'm accountable to them. Okay, so the words infallibility, inerrancy, they're important words, authority, important words, but we the rubber hits the road on our accountability. Hmm. So when I see myself as accountable to those human instruments so that I can be accountable to God, then I talk about then what kind of reader do I need to be? Now, that's really what the reformers were getting at when they spoke of the plain reading of Scripture. They were saying we have to read it the way that those human instruments intended for it to be read. Certainly, if they intended a metaphor, we better read it as a metaphor. God is a rock. You know, we don't say, you know, sedimentary or metamorphic. You know, we plain reading says they meant a metaphor. We read it as a metaphor. Um, so 
the idea of plain reading means reading it the way they intended it to be read. Now, that means I have to know a little bit about them. What is inerrant and infallible is their meaning. And therefore, I better do everything within my ability to understand their meaning. Now, that means I have to try to respect their context. By that, I mean their linguistic context. That is, plain reading of English only gets me part way. They didn't speak English. Plain reading is going to connect to Hebrew and Greek eventually. So their linguistic context, their uh, literary context, what's the genre? Is it a parable? How do I know? Is it this or that or the other thing? How do I know? I have to respect their context, literary. I have to respect their historical context. And I have to respect their cultural context. Because all of those things affect how they communicate. So a plain reading isn't an unencumbered reading. Hmm. In fact, it is very much an encumbered reading because we are committing ourselves to trying to read what they intend to say. And that does not come intuitively. So planning, plain reading does not mean intuitive reading. It means that we want to read it in accordance with how they meant it. Hmm. And that makes so much sense because we do that with all other forms of communication, don't we? Indeed. You, you know, um, I had on a while back um, Janine Brown, Janine K. Brown, former professor of mine at Bethel, and she was reflecting on her own experience growing up with the way the Bible was treated. And she talks about how so many times people treat it as this magic book, not just a, a sacred, inspired, okay. authoritative book, but they treat it magically as if... Uh, all of a sudden, when we read this book to get at its meaning, we use all of these different sorts of intuitive, mm -hmm. dare I even say Gnostic-like tools to try to get at the meaning. And it's interesting. Like, I don't, when I open up an email, when we had some email exchange before this, you know, my goal in trying to understand the email was, well, what what's John's intentions? You mm -hmm. know, I wasn't sure. looking for a metaphor unless you put a metaphor right. in there. And that that really changes the way that many evangelicals, there's quite a few evangelicals, but I think probably a good percentage of the listeners to this program have grown up in some evangelical context. That in some ways, it's it seems like that's a very different way than what we've been trained. Why do you, I mean, why do you think that is? I think it's because, number one, when we get the Old Testament, we we struggle. Um, we try to read it, and it doesn't make any sense to us because, of course, it's a different language, different culture. It's foreign to us, and we don't want the Bible to feel foreign to us. So we subconsciously, at least, do everything in our power to appropriate it into our lives and culture. Now, eventually, we do need to do that, but there are proper steps that should be used. Mm -hmm. And since there's no means by which people can do that except through their intuition and they don't necessarily want to admit that I'm making this stuff up <laughs> what we do unfortunately is we credit the holy spirit yeah mm -hmm. I was reading this morning and the spirit told me okay now the spirit does a lot of important things uh, even when we read scripture but among them is not doing interpretation for us. It can help us appropriate and apply. It can help us uh, experience conviction or enlightenment. But it's not going to tell us what the truth of Scripture is. Once we discover the truth of Scripture, then the Holy Spirit helps us to do something with that truth. So the whole, we don't count on the Holy Spirit to tell us the meaning of Hebrew words. We don't count on the Holy Spirit to parse our verbs for us, though every Hebrew student wishes. <laughs> we, we don't expect the Holy Spirit to explain to us what the Babylonian sense of this was. We, right? The Holy right. Spirit does not do interpretation for us. I and that, that was really... 
it's the very fact that people have proceeded as if he did that's gotten to the gotten the church into much much trouble generation after generation I was just going to say, you know, I grew up in a charismatic evangelical context, a place that really heavy emphasis on the Spirit's working and all sorts of things. And I know this was one area for me that was really difficult because I guess when I would hear, um, you know, I, what I do consider now to be a proper hermeneutic of Scripture, what I heard was, well, the Spirit can't speak to you. And instead, I think for those that are maybe listening that come from a charismatic framework, I, what I hear, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, John, but what I hear you saying is we need to get closer to the inspiration of the Spirit. <laughs> and that was vested in human authors in their context. Is that a fair way of putting it? Yeah, yeah. Another way that I put it is, you know, Every time I sit down and try to, you know, write write commentary, exegete scripture, interpret, or even read in a more casual way, um, certainly I would pray for the Spirit to help me understand. Uh, no questions. Now, does that mean maybe sometimes the Holy Spirit does give me ideas about the meaning of Hebrew word? Okay? I don't want to rule that out. But here's the thing, and this is the most important part. I can never use that, the Spirit, in an appeal to authority. I can never say, this is right, because mm. the Holy Spirit told me. Because then you're the authority, right? Right, exactly. And somebody else say, well, the Holy Spirit told me something different. Okay, so the Spirit may well help in all kinds of ways that we don't know. But you can never use that as appeal to authority. Well, what do you do, John, when someone comes to you and they say, Dr. Walton... I've read your book, read your books, plural, on Genesis, and I'm concerned as I read these books that you're not taking the Bible literally. How do you respond to that? Does locating God's inspired revelation by investigating authorial intention in a text, does that end up just eliminating categories like literal and symbolic? Are these sorts of artificial designations that we place on the text? How do you well, respond think, to that? Yeah, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about literal reading. Uh, first of all, are you really talking about reading the English literally? Um, we know that, that the English is a translation and therefore an interpretation. Okay, so if you really want to read the Bible literally, learn Hebrew, learn Greek, learn Aramaic. Yeah, yeah. Okay, secondly, usually when people talk about reading literally, they're um, casting doubts upon people who come to what they believe to be figurative or symbolic interpretations. Okay, and with that, I just go back to the question of what was the author's intention? And in fact, reading literally means we read it exactly as the author intended it. That's literal reading. Now, some people would read Genesis and say, when I read this literally, I, I hear all kinds of modern science. Well, are you thinking that's what the author intended? Now, sometimes they would say, well, that's what God intended. But wait a minute. God worked through yeah. these authors. Yeah. Right? So we're back to methodology. But my commitment to literal reading is a commitment to the author's intentions. Because that's what I'm accountable to. So I'm not going to read something allegorically or figuratively if I don't think the author meant it that way. If I do think the author meant it that way, I better be able to demonstrate how I come to the conclusion that the author meant it that way. Hmm. Oftentimes what people end up thinking when they say they're reading literally is they're reading intuitively, which is a different thing altogether. Because our intuitions are modern. Our intuitions are foreign to the biblical text. And so intuitive is not the same as literal, but most people who say they're reading literally are actually reading intuitively. Yeah, and that really helps when you probably hear objections like, say, well, Dr. Walton, if you're saying that Genesis 1, and we're going to start unpacking this stuff in a little bit, if you're saying... Genesis 1 isn't laying out for us, uh, you know, if we had a, somehow a, a video camcorder, gosh, 
do people even use camcorders <laughs> as a dated reference? <laughs> um, as an eighties, nineties kid here, uh, if, if someone had a video camcorder for America's funniest home videos and they phone, were phone. <laughs> yes, a phone, there we go. And they were somehow, you know, filming God's creative act in the world. You know, are you, if you're telling me, John, that what we get in Genesis one isn't like a, a, a video representation of God's creative act in the world, then I, I feel like, do I have to question whether or not Jesus rose from the dead? And what you're saying is, well, what we need to get at, if we get at the author's intentions, we're getting to the inspired truth of that exactly. text. That's right. So uh, reducing it to what a video would see is truly reductionistic because video only sees certain things and video is its own medium. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And a video medium is not the same thing as a literary medium. Hmm. And so again, that's imposing something foreign on the text. Imposing a modern bias, right? right? You're trying to squeeze it into a, a category that did not exist. Yeah, I my, again, my undergrad was in history, and so even as and I, I taught ancient history for years, and even just the realization that the the way we modern people view what history is is different than the way ancient people. So we, I impose when we impose this sort of like video camcorder or phone, yeah. you know, uh, video of how things were to be that that's that is us placing something on top of the text in in something that might be damaging to our ability to actually rightly discern it right and exactly and our our goal in reading the bible is not to kind of get past the author to the event to mm. say we're going to figure out or reconstruct precisely what really happened in the event we don't want to do that. What's inspired is not the event. What's inspired is the text and that the author has given to us. We want to know the author's read on the event. We don't want to get to it as some kind of independent, freestanding thing. We want the author's interpretation of the event. And basically, the biblical view is, you want to know what really happened? I'm going to tell you what really happened and why, <laughs> and we're going to take their word for it. Well, so that's what I'd like to do with our time together, John, is uh, you are an excellent top-of-the-line Old Testament scholar, one of my favorites. And I know for a lot of people who have grown up in similar contexts to the ones you and I grew up in— um, especially for me as an 80s, 90s kid living in the culture war, there was a lot of tension, and there still is today, around science and faith issues. Uh, I, I know for a lot of people, they get to a point where they were told that the plain reading of Genesis 1, Genesis 2 and 3, and, and even I'd like to get to today some of Noah's flood story, that the plain reading of that meant particular answers to scientific questions, and then they felt like they had to choose between their geology textbook and their Bible. And so what I'd like to do is maybe see if once we step into the author's world, we step into that ancient world with you as a trusted tour guide, if there's some ways that you can help us unpack the meanings of several of these key sections in Genesis so that Maybe as a side product or as a byproduct of this exegesis, maybe people would get a sense that, hey, you know, there's a different way that faith and science conversations can happen. And if that sounds good to you, I'd like to start with Genesis 1. It's the sure. beginning. You know, it's a good place to begin. And, you know, much of the way, as I reflect on Genesis 1, we were chatting beforehand, and, you know, I, I went to a K-12 through evangelical Christian school, many great things about that. Um, but one of the things that I'm, I'm not so wild about is the way that Genesis 1 was presented. Uh, and the way I understood it at the time, Genesis 1 was focused on a historical, scientific eyewitness account of the beginnings of the material universe. And of course, this becomes, became a problem for me when I got into university and I'm starting to see a lot of evidence that the Earth could be older than six to 10,000 years old. I, I know you're not a scientist. I'm not asking you to comment on that. But I felt like I had to either believe that 
right? Cling to the Bible, cling to this, this, this thing that's the centerpiece of my faith. Or I had to accept these godless evolutionists who were telling me that it was, you know, if we've got a 14 billion year old universe. So that was a lot of tension. I know a lot of people experience that tension. Is Genesis 1 trying to do something like answer my scientific questions? Or do you think there's a better way to understand it? I definitely think there's a better way. Again, if we are faithful to being accountable to the authors, we have to ask how they are thinking and what they are presenting. They don't know science. They, they don't know our science at all. And therefore, they're not anticipating our scientific theories or addressing them. But yet they have important, truthful things to say. It's interesting that in our modernness, when we say, well, this is about creation, our brains immediately go to science. Hmm. Because to us, creation is a scientific question, a scientific issue. Why in the world should we think that they would have thought that? And I need to figure out how they thought about creation. Now, you may say, well, what, what's there to... What's up for question here? What, what in the world could be a difference? So let me use a, a quick illustration, if I may. Um, I'm asking the question, what kind of creation account is this? Okay, it's a good exercise. Okay, so let's use an analogy. So you're going to a, a big play downtown, and uh, you're really excited, but unfortunately, there's heavy traffic and there's construction and there's bad weather and there's no parking. And and you end up parking a mile away, walk through the rain, and you end up, much to your dismay, getting to the theater half an hour late. And you squeeze into your place in a darkened theater. And you're just really frustrated. And you poke the person next to you in your frustration. You've lost all social filters. You poke <laughs> the person next to you and you say, how did the play begin? Now, this person turns out is very helpful and says, well, the script was written in the 1930s. It was a very important piece. That it's and you say, no, 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 no. Uh, that's, that's not my question. You said, he says, well, you asked how the play began. It has to begin with a script. Can't have a play without a script. And you say, yeah, yeah, I get that. I, I, okay, okay, I'm hearing you, but that's not what I want to know. Lady on the other side says, oh, I can help. Um, this this uh, set was constructed for a black box theater, and it was meant in order to... <laughs> you say, no, 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 no. She says, well, you certainly can't have a play without a set. You know, so uh, that's how the play began, by the set being constructed. You say, no, that's, that, that's not what I was asking. Now the person behind you is getting involved, which is nice, instead of shushing you, you know? And the person behind you says, oh, the, the cast was chosen by the... And you say, no, 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 I, I understand you need people and a cast in order for a play, but that's not what I'm asking. I want to know what happened since the curtain opened. And they say, well, I thought you wanted to know how the play began. Hmm. Now, you see, the important thing here is all those are right answers. All of those are ways of looking at how the play began. And they don't contradict each other. They're not making competing truth claims. They're all answering the question, but from different perspectives. Okay, now the same thing can happen when we ask, how did the world begin? You know, what happened in the beginning? Well, again, in the analogy, in the beginning was the script. In the beginning, was the stage in the beginning was the cast. And so what beginning are we talking about? And it doesn't help us to say, which is the one I want to hear? Mm -hmm. We're not in charge. Yeah, in this case, it'd be what, what's the beginning of the story that an ancient agrarian, right. Semitic people in the ancient right. Near East want to hear? How do right? they think about how the story began? how the world began. And again, to say one doesn't mean they don't recognize another, okay? Because again, in my question about how did the play begin, I would recognize the validity of all of those. It's not a matter of awareness, it's a matter of interest. Mm. 
what's the story they want to tell? And they get to tell their story. We can't impose our demands or our story on them. So when we read the text of Genesis 1, we have to try to figure out what story are they trying to tell me? Now, even the fact that we call it an account of origins, okay? Think about our modern world. When we say origins, we've got the word science just pounding yeah, on yeah. that word, defining it, okay? We can't do that, okay? This is not an account of scientific origins. There are other options, and we can't, here's the way to say it, I guess, we can't assume that it's an account of scientific origins just because that's how we would package it, okay? We want to ask how they are thinking about it, okay? So that means we have to be aware of alternatives, which is hard, because then we have to say, okay, what are the things around in their world? What would they be saying? One of the ways I get, get into that is to say, let's stop calling it an account of origins. I mean, it is, but the right kind of origins, whatever that might yeah, be. Yeah. Let's call it what I think it more importantly is, an account of cosmic identity. Hmm. What is the cosmos? Now, sometimes a study of origins can lead us to an understanding of identity. Okay? But again, what kind of origins are we talking about? So. I, as I understand Genesis 1, it's an account of cosmic identity, trying to help people understand what this cosmos is, which includes what God's purposes were. That's where science can't talk. Yeah, yeah. Science can't talk about purpose. Okay, but that's what the Bible is most interested in. Again, sometimes people say it, it's not about the what and the where, it's or the when, it's about the who and the why. Okay, and again, that means that we're dealing with not competing truth claims, but different sorts of truth claims that actually can coexist and be compliant, not compliant. Um, you know, Harmon they, harmonious? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the compatible, there's the word compatible, I wanted. Yeah. They can be compatible with one another. And so, again, I mean, if the Bible were making scientific claims, then I would have to assess those scientific claims. But if it's not, then I don't want to bring the science into it. Hmm. So why, you know, help us understand a little bit more about why then the biblical author would nestle in, in a story about with things like days and things being made on specific days and how that would in any way help answer an ancient N near eastern people's questions about their identity the cosmos and their place in it yeah one of the highest values in the ancient world was order an ordered cosmos an ordered life an ordered society in, in the Bible and in the ancient world, wisdom is the path to order. And that's why wisdom was so important, because order was important. For them, they wanted to know that God had ordered the world in his creation of it. In fact, in the ancient world, creation is the creation of order. Because in the ancient world, they didn't share our belief that something exists when it's material. Hmm. They believed that something exists when it has a role and a function and a purpose in an ordered system. Then it exists. That's a big difference. It is. And of course, if creation is bringing in something into existence, you better know what they think about existence. Yeah. So you can talk about creation. And so they're, they're giving a creation story based on their ideas of existence and based on their priority, value of order. God's the one who makes it work. Hmm. 
and the one who orders it is the one who's in charge. Think about when a new CEO, CEO takes over a company. Restructuring, we call it. Hmm. Think about when a new president comes into the office. Well, we've experienced that. Restructuring. You set it all up under your leadership ideas, ordered according to your desires, to make it work with your purposes and the things you want it to do. That's what God does hmm. in the cosmos. He orders it according to a purpose. Now, what is that purpose? Well, in fact, Genesis 1 and early 2 tells us, but we miss it because we don't know the ancient world. We get to day seven, and it says God rested. And we say, what in the world is that? <laughs> he's that tired. Make, he had to take a day off. And he it all. You know? He's on sabbatical um, too, John. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, God doesn't get tired. He doesn't need a nap. What in the world? Oh, this must just have to do with Jewish Sabbath. So it doesn't have anything to do with me. It's unimportant. Forget day seven. Let's call it the six days of creation. We should be panicking right now. Because they did include the seventh day. And it's our lack of understanding that poses a problem. Because everybody in the ancient world knew that when gods rest, they rest in temples. And when gods rest, they don't rest on a couch, <laughs> or on a bed, or on a futon, or in a recliner. They rest on the throne. They take up their rule. And therefore, their resting is not disengaging, like we think of it, relaxation. Their rest is engaging. Now, in the running of this ordered system, which is set up with the very purpose of running it. Now, what drives that ordered system in the biblical view? Well, it's very clear. Because when God rests in his temple, Psalm 132, a great passage. When God rests in his temple, he is ruling. And as he rests in his temple, he is living out his presence among his people. And so Genesis 1 tells us that God created us to be in relationship with him living in his presence. He created us to live among us, and he set up the world to work that way. It is ordered to be a place where we can dwell alongside of God as he rules in the world that he has ordered. And he set, us up, he set it up that we would help him. He doesn't need our help, but he created us in his image to do what? Subdue and rule. Hmm. Those are ordering procedures. And therefore, God ordered the world, but now he has enlisted people to work alongside him to continue bringing order in this world. His order, not ours, his order into this world. So the whole creation narrative is focused on God ordering the world to work for us. But it's a B and B. It's for us, but he's going to be there. Yeah. Not yeah. an Airbnb. It's okay. a regular, he wants to be <laughs> there with us. Mm. And so this sets up the whole motif of God's presence, God's abiding presence in relationship with his people, which is the theme of the Bible. And it's not just descriptive either for these people, right? The, 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 the audience is looking for prescription on how to live as well. And so in that sense, is it fair to say that Genesis 1 is a, a prescriptive picture as well? Well, in that sense, if God is dwelling among us, we better be engaged in bringing his order. And of course, one of the ways that the Bible defines his order was in Torah, because Torah defined how Israelites would live in God's presence and God living among them. So if that's the overarching intended meaning for that audience, there's still maybe a, a couple lingering questions people might have even as they accept that. I know, for instance, there is questions about well, what do we do with something, let's say, even like 
a, a term like formless and void that we see very early on. I, I, I'm not uh, adept at Hebrew, but uh, as I understand, tobu, tobu wabohu, tohu, tohu wabohu. You can correct me on Close that. Close enough. Close enough. Okay, good. I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to hearing it saying correctly. You know, um, there are certainly questions about, well, what, well, what does that mean? You know, you've got people like processed theists who would argue, well, see, this is like a David Ray Griffin, for example. The people that have been listening to this podcast know we've covered some episodes just doing some exploration on different theological systems in our Proverbial series. And someone like a David Ray Griffin says, hey, it's right here in Genesis 1. God had to work with pre-existing materials. That's what that means. You know, working with something, this isn't evidence for creation out of nothing. Um, is that even that sort of question? Is that imposing something on this text that isn't in the purview of the author, or is it a fair question to go, "Hey, it, it seems maybe like God is working with something here"? Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't argue against the idea that when the narrative of Genesis starts, it imagines things already there. Verse two: the sea, the earth. That doesn't mean that God had pre-existing matter. It just means they're not starting the story at the same place. Mm. Okay, so they're starting the story the way an ancient Near Eastern text would start the story. That is, all ancient Near Eastern creation stories are about God bringing order to the stuff that's there. That doesn't mean that gods didn't create the stuff that's there, the material, but just that's not the important part. The important part is how it works. Uh, an example I use sometimes is that, you know, when you look at your electronic devices, you know, your phone or your iPad or your iPod or something like that, and somebody says, well, tell me about, you know, um, your, your iPad. You don't start by talking about the polymers in the screen in the case uh, mm -hmm. that make it up. You, you start assuming that and you talk about your applications or your operating system or, you know, things like that. Um, so you, you start with kind of assumption. Yeah, sure, somebody manufactured that case of your computer, that screen, okay? But that's not what interests you about it. So we can't approach the text with our modern presuppositions and questions. They're all about ordering the, the world, so they start with a non-ordered world. That's what Tohu is. Okay, now I think it even goes so far as not just non-ordered, but if order defines existence, that also means it's basically non-existent in their terms, not mm. in our terms. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it starts with non-order, and therefore God brings order. Now, to that extent, Genesis 1 is not talking about creation out of nothing, because that question is a material question. And the interest of Genesis is not material, so it's not going to address that. Theologically, of course, I believe God created everything in every way at some point in the beginning out of nothing. But we can't just ask our theological and scientific questions. What is the text doing? And so in that sense, it starts with non-order, and it talks about ordering. That means it was non-existent because it was non-ordered, and then it came into existence when it was ordered with role and function and purpose. Mm. And that so, seems like it would be existentially more satisfying to an ancient Near Eastern person to have that story as also a means of perhaps giving someone a prescriptive guide for, hey, you know what, there's a lot of things that you're in, in, engaging with in the world that don't seem like they have a particular order to them, mm -hmm. right? In ways that we can't right. imagine as modern people. We've got so many functions that seem to just run autonomously. You know, all of our smartphones and devices, we mm -hmm. can go to the grocery store and there's just magically groceries there. But if you're, you know, if you're a subsistence farmer, you know, you're working difficult land with your hands, it it might feel like, hey, I th there's there's something here I'm going to have to like bring out of something else. Well, see, and that's the thing. They believe that God brought order, but yet, why are they living in a world that's so lacking in order? And to some extent, Genesis, the early chapters, addresses that as well. And that's largely because 
early on, it's called chapter three, they chose to abandon God's order as kind of the primary thing in order to pursue their own order. And that has never worked well. Right. That's disorder. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that seems like a good... I know people are going to have a million questions about each one of these sections. And of course, I'm going to link in the description. Um, I'll put in links for all of the books so we can get a lot more detail. But I would like to move in because that's that a good segue into looking at the, the second, what scholars commonly refer to as the, the second of two creation accounts. And I, I first even want to explore this a little bit, John, if you can help people who aren't biblical scholars, haven't been to seminary, understand why when we move into Genesis 2 and into chapter 3, all the way to verse 24, why do biblical scholars frequently refer to that story, we could just say Adam and Eve and Eden, Adam and Eve and the fall, as a potentially separate creation story from Genesis 1. How do you view that? Well, certainly they have different focus. So it's not surprising that people would look at them and say, these really seem different. Um, the question of their continuity is an intriguing one. People generally assume, well, if humans were created on day six, and if they assume chapter two is about the creation of humans, then chapter two must be an explanation of day six. That's a possible conclusion, but it's not the only conclusion, and it's not the one that I would favor. Um, I introduced already that I look at Genesis 1 as an account of cosmic identity. What is the cosmos? What's it been ordered to be and do? A place of God's presence in relationship with his people. Move to chapter 2, and now again, this is not scientific, biological, chemical, biochemical origins. So we call it an account of human origins. Whoops, wait. Have we inadvertently mislabeled it by our own expectations? Hmm. And I'm going to make the same move here as I made in chapter one. This is not intended to be account, an account of scientific origins of humanity. It is intended to discuss human identity. Who are we? What's going on? And the Bible has a new number of things to affirm about that. And it's theology expo you know, brought out in Genesis 2. That is, we are people who um, find our source of being in God. Hmm. We are people who are mortal. We are dust. We are people who are in relationship with God. We are people who have been given a role in the world around us, naming the animals, for instance, uh, work in the garden, for instance. We are people in relationship with one another, male and female. It says an awful lot about human identity and our role that God has given us and our role in the world in which he has put us. And we're trying to talk DNA. <laughs> we're missing the point. Again, what does the biblical author have in mind? And so human identity easily trumps the scientific elements. And we know that today as well, because we're all wrapped up in trying to deal with issues of human identity. Hmm. But somehow we don't think that way when we get to Genesis. So, you know, you, you pose this possibility that we're not necessarily talking about um, Genesis 2 being like an immediately chronological succession mm -hmm. of Genesis 1, whether we want to look at it as all happening on day, <clears throat> pardon me, day 6, which again, I guess we could take a lot of time to explore even what might be the, the importance behind naming these events as happening on days as opposed to mm -hmm any other unit of time, maybe we should say something briefly about that too. But um, what I hear you saying is that we don't necessarily have to think of Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve, the garden and the fall as being like, well, we're moving to the next chronological scene in the movie here, that this is, this is telling us something that if we only had the first account, we would be missing some key ingredients in God's revelation that Genesis 2 tells us that two and three tell us that Genesis one 
doesn't disclose in as much detail. Is that fair to say? Sure. Again, they have very different purposes. That doesn't mean we have to say they come from different sources. It doesn't suggest that they are somehow conflicting in their approach. Um, they just have different different parts of the puzzle to put together. And can you say something? Because I know I, I threw out to some listeners if they had questions in advance that I could bring up to you. And I know there was a lot of questions from people that have engaged some of your work about like, all right, but why name it as days at all in Genesis 1, right? Like what's what's the quick, maybe the quick answer you could give about, well, the reason why the authors would talk about this as days and we don't have to get into day age theories or is it a 24 hour period of a material creation at all? That that's just not even a relevant question, but why, you know, why tell it in this way with six days leading to the seventh? Well, I see that as connected to what I mentioned earlier about this being connected to God's rest in a temple. That is, they're telling the story of Genesis, which talks about how the cosmos was ordered to be sacred space, God's presence. Okay, they're telling that story. And they have stories in their own experience about sacred space being constructed and God living there. It's the temple. It's the tabernacle. Construction of sacred space and God taking up his dwelling among people to be in relationship with them. So they have that kind of construction of sacred space story. What we often don't recognize is that those construction of sacred space stories have that moment when everything is materially ready. So the temple has been built. There it stands. But it's not sacred space yet because God isn't in it. And so how do you get from the material structure to it being a temple with God's presence? Well, we know that in the Bible. It's a dedication ceremony where they celebrate the inauguration of God's presence living among them. And in those construction of sacred space stories, that inauguration is seven days mm. when it begins to actually function as a temple. So it makes a lot of sense that they totally. would understand construction of the cosmic sacred space in terms of seven days of inauguration. Mm, that that's helpful. That's helpful. I, I I thought it would be good to address that before we move into Genesis two and three here in the Adam and Eve story. Yeah, you know, I think we've all, if you spend any amount of time in church, you've probably seen a Adam and Eve flannel graph story mm -hmm. or some sort of uh, you know they brought in the old uh, VHS player into to kids' church or Sunday school to play a cartoon about Adam and Eve, and so we often have that shape. Uh, our imaginations to conceive of Adam and the story in Genesis 2 and 3 about an individual human named Adam, an individual named Eve. And I think a lot of people struggle who read maybe your Lost World of Adam and Eve book, um, John, and they go, okay, you, ma you make an argument here that maybe... Maybe that's not the best way to conceive of it, um, that maybe we're not talking about a singular individual named Adam. Uh, it might be something more than that. So can you lay out a bit of your evidence to support this idea that we might be talking about more than just an individual person named Adam? And then maybe explain how you make sense of texts like Romans 5, for example, in the New Testament, where it seems like, boy, are we just it seems like in Romans 5, we're talking about one Adam, just as sin came into the world through one man, right? So how do you reconcile that with the evidence that you see in Genesis 2 and 3? I don't object to Adam and Eve being considered individuals. As a matter of fact, I'm generally inclined to say they are real people in a real past. But that is not what's most important to the Genesis author. And that's not what's most important about their role. So I don't deny that, but I think that we need to transcend that. We need to get to the, the bigger thing. Is there that, evidence that the text does that? In yes, Genesis and that's exactly okay. what I spend lots of my time on. Uh, so I use the term archetypes. That is, an archetype um, represents more than just themselves. Okay, and so in that sense, uh, Abram is an archetype. 
you know, he's a real person, an individual, and you know, all of that, but he's more than that. Uh, and Paul talks about the archetype of all who have faith. I mean, you know, Abraham stands right up there. So uh, just because we talk about the archetypal significance of someone doesn't mean that we are dismissing their individuality or personhood. Okay. But again, we're trying to read with the text. So what makes me think that the text is treating Adam as an archetype? Well, one of the things is uh, when it talks about their names, those aren't their historical names. That's not what they would have called each other. How do we know? Well, we went back in our TARDIS machine. No, no. Okay. <laughs> we know <laughs> because the words Adam and Eve are Hebrew words. And Hebrew did not exist as a language until after Moses. And therefore, if they have Hebrew names, that's because the Israelites gave them Hebrew names to write about them. And those names have meaning that fit into their archetypal role and value. So right from the get-go, the names signal that. Um, secondly, an archetype um, is a sort of representation, meaning that what's true of the archetype is true of everybody. And it's not important because it's true of the archetype. It's important because it's true of everybody. So when the biblical text talks about um, Adam being dust, we ask the question, well, is that only true of Adam? He's dust, but the rest of us were born of woman. Mm. Okay, and so, so that we're, we're ontologically different. Well, no, that's certainly not the point the text is making. The very point the text is making is that we are all dust. And we know that because that is extrapolated to all of humanity uh, in various places in the Bible. Um, particularly the verse in Psalms that says, you know, we, uh, we remember that we are dust. We. So we're all dust. And being dust doesn't preclude being born of woman, because we're all dust and we're born of woman. So to say that Adam is dust is not to suggest that he was not born of woman, because it doesn't imply that. By the way, another piece that's not in the book that I now emphasize a little bit more, is that um, in chapter 2, verse 7, where it says that the Lord God formed humanity, Adam. Because there's an article in front of it too, right? It's not just yeah, right. a name, right? Right. But then we translate either of dust or from dust. There's no preposition there. Interesting. There's no from, there's no of, there is no preposition. Lord God formed the human, hard break, dust of the earth. Identity, uh, not chemistry. Uh, and so, again, even our translations can kind of push us in a different direction. But that, that verse in Psalms uh, 103, uh, that he formed us. Okay, we are dust. Um, and in fact, forming, because of our scientific world, we think of in material terms. Oh, you form it, potter and clay, you know. But in Hebrew, it's used for the forming of identity. Hmm. Okay? And so he forms our spirit within us, Zechariah 12. So forming is identity, and likewise in that psalm, you know our form. That is, you know our identity, not our shape. Hmm. You know our identity, our form, that we are dust, our identity. So again, the problem comes when we read the text through our modern lenses, scientifically attuned, and ask those questions, make those assumptions, rather than letting the text speak. So you you feel like it can be a both and, that Adam could be a historical person and an archetype, 
And I think you've even made the argument that there there could even be evidence intentionally that that is intended to be both cases in the use of the indefinite article like the in front of Adam in Genesis 2, correct, and into Genesis 3, and then all of a sudden we get into Genesis 4, and that article is dropped. It would, you know, I was even talking to my 12-year-old son about some of this stuff this week, and he goes, well, Dad, why do the Bible translators then just say, instead of saying the human or the man in Genesis 2 and 3, why do they still go with Adam then? Again, translations are tied to traditions in many cases. Yeah. And uh, those are the kinds of things. I mean, it's it's a it's a tough task because the, it's, you know, as you know, you can't just put Hebrew in an English box and have it work. That's right, it's yeah. It's a lot more complicated than that. Hmm. Okay, so what does this do then? Let's say, you know, I'm... I, I'm no longer a young earth creationist. Um, and I, I'm, of course, listeners of this program know, welcome all sorts of different perspectives on this. But even though I'm not, I still get the theological challenges that the, in particular, the 19th century and the scientific discoveries of the 19th century. I think, don't think most people know, like, we didn't really know dinosaurs existed till the 19th century. You know, that's a pretty new discovery. So there's new things we've uncovered. Um, you know, and a lot of people maybe don't know that the the, ge- the uh, modern geology that we have now came about as people were going out looking for evidence of a, a global flood. And then they ended up finding a bunch of different cataclysms and that the earth was much older. So even as I accept that you know, God's book of general revelation seems to paint this sort of material picture of our of our earth. I, I still know that people wrestle with how to theologically understand the whole arc of scripture then, you know, especially because it's been framed in a more traditional Augustinian framework that we go, you know, every instance of pain and suffering, the reason why we have hurricanes, the reason why we have a COVID-19 is because Adam sinned. Right, and we place this all on the shoulders of a historical Adam in a in the material Eden, and then once you maybe get open up to the possibility that there could be deeper layers of meaning to that story, and you're open to, well, hey, you know what? There's pretty sound evidence. Like we had things like cancer on this planet long before a historical Adam, just using the genealogies, could have lived. Um, how, you know, what do you do to just offer encouragement or any sort of um, helpful advice to helping people consider what the implications of some of these conclusions from the text might mean on the larger theology of Scripture? So we read Genesis 1 and we keep reading, it was good, it was good, it was good. And in our brains, especially since Augustine has tampered with them, we read, it was perfect, it was perfect, it was perfect. That is not the sense of the Hebrew word here. Hebrew has words for perfect, and this is not those. Okay, once we think about the creation account not as material that's perfect, but as order which is functional, that's what good means. It is functioning in an ordered system, in an ordered way. That's not the same thing as Augustine's perfect. So that leads us to say, well, wait a minute. That means that God did not create things perfect. He created them with a modicum of order, optimally ordered. I don't know what words we want to use, but yet still needing order. There was an outside the garden. It was not as ordered as the inside the garden. There was still darkness and sea, which are elements of non-order in the ancient world. And of course, Revelation tells us that in new creation that is fully ordered, we're not going to have those. There was no sea. You say, what? No swimming? No, it's not about that. <laughs> okay, so, so we have to recalibrate our ways of thinking. And Augustine at this point, he's got a plenty of good things for us, but at this point doesn't help us because he had an assumption and we've seen no reason to, to think of it different ways. So in that sense, the ordered world included death. 
because God had not conquered it yet. He gave them a possible antidote, tree of life, but they lost access to that antidote. Okay, and so therefore we are subject to death, as Paul tells us. We are subject to it not because we were created immortal. Paul knows Genesis. He knows there's a tree of life. Immortal people don't need a tree of life. <laughs> so he recognizes this. We are dust. We are mortal. God gave an antidote, tree of life. We blew it, lost the tree of life, and therefore we are subject to death, as Paul said. But that means there are lots of things in our system that are not ideal. Yet, as Job, when Yahweh speaks to Job in chapter 38, one of the main things he's accomplishing there is to say, Job, there's far more order than what you know. Mm. And he gives him plenty of examples. And that's true of us too. We've learned, for instance, that even though we experience earthquakes very negatively with destruction and death, if the earth wasn't doing that, shifting the plates, we'd have big problems. Mm -hmm. So that's part of order. That ordering of the way the tectonic plates shift sometimes brings us into very uncomfortable situations. That's also true of bacteria and viruses. Um, I think I'll get the numbers straight here. I didn't make these up or research them, but this is what I've heard from people <laughs> who know. Something like there are 10 to the 23rd different kinds of bacteria and a very, very, very high percentage of them, like over 99%, are beneficial. Hmm. And if we didn't have them, we couldn't live. Yeah. There are also the same number, 10 to the 23rd, if that's the right number, don't quote me on that. <laughs> um, but viruses. And a high percentage of the viruses control the bacteria. And if we didn't have them, we couldn't live. Mm -hmm. So we can't just say, oh, bacteria and viruses cause illness and they're sin. They're a result of sin. No, they're not. They're part of God's created world. There's more order than you know. And yes, sometimes they bring death and sickness and discomfort. But that doesn't mean they're not part of the ordered system. You know, people tend to think that Adam and Eve couldn't feel pain. Really? They had no nerve endings? <laughs> what kind of body would it be without nerve endings? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? You, I mean, our nervous system protects us. Well, there'd be no sensation of pleasure either then. Yeah, exactly. So that's, yeah. that's just not thinking through. Of course, Adam and Eve could experience pain. Or that they could eat other fruit which means other things in the garden are decomposing. Yeah. You know, they're, they're going through some sort of destructive exactly. process. So you're not then a proponent that even, you know, if we were to step into this, this world of Eden, that, um, you know, lions would only eat celery stalks and kale. Nope. Hmm. Nope. So God has set up the world to be what it is. But it was supposed to be moving toward his order. Instead, we have been pushing it toward our order, order for us. And that's the problem. We have been working, we have not been working alongside God with his order in mind. Okay, so one of the final hiccups that people have, maybe they're tracking with you so far and they go, hey, I can I can jive with this. I might need to pick up your book to understand more. But you know, they go, all right, so what do I do then when I've gone to the Natural History Museum and I, uh, you know, see these dinosaur bones, I see the woolly mammoths, I see evidence of ice ages and all these other things, but they don't tell me anything about a global flood. Do I just have to throw out that Noah story or, you know, Dr. Walton, is there something, again, am I doing something wrong if I step into Noah's story and, and I go looking for a worldwide catastrophe. So, you know, I'd really love to, I know we've, we're, we're pushing close to an hour here, but at least to maybe give some sort of overview to help people understand that a little bit and whet their appetite to go pick up the, the lost, uh, lost World of the Flood book that you have. Well, of course, again, I would insist we have to read the text both for what the text says and what the, what the culture uh, tells us about what the author was trying to communicate. Uh, the 
purpose of the flood account in Genesis is not really a mystery. It's a reset button. That is, everything is devolved into disorder, violence everywhere, and God is pushing the reset button. So non-order, the, the waters come back, and then land emerges and people emerge. It's a retelling of the creation story. And uh, order is set again. I mean, that's all based into Noah's name. Again, Hebrew, Noah, rest. He's the one that's going through him. Order is going to be reestablished. And that's what the flood story is about. That's the theological message. The flood story is not, and in these chapters, God has revealed to us that there was a flood. God doesn't have to reveal that there was a flood in the ancient world. Everybody believed there was a flood. They already know the event. So the revelation is not there was an event, a cataclysmic event. It was cataclysmic and it was an event, but that's not the Bible's task. Like I said, everybody knew there was such an event, that it was cataclysmic. And we have accounts of that in contemporary. Yeah, outside of the Bible. Yeah, right? sure. Babylonians, etc. So they already know it's there. The big question is, why? What? What was God doing and why was he doing it? And for that, of course, Genesis has a far different answer than what the Babylonian accounts would have had. So what do the Babylonians think then, as we were, if we were to compare these and say, well, there's a competing <laughs> claim. Yeah. Well, the Babylonians thought that the gods just got tired of people. They're so <laughs> annoying. And so <laughs> decided, decided to wipe them all out. No exceptions. But one of the gods said, you know, that's, uh, frankly, that's stupid. Don't. And so he arranges for some people to be spared. Um, because the, unfortunately, the main group of the gods had not looked ahead enough to remember that their only way of getting food was from humans. And <laughs> that, hey, if we wipe them out, we wipe out our food supply. That's not a good idea. See, nobody thought of that. And so, so. When some humans are spared, then the gods say, oh, okay, we had a stupid moment and, um, <laughs> you know, really we need people. And, you know, obviously not anything like the biblical account. Well, that even gets at the big differences between the, 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 the stories of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and what that means for uh, our sense of meaning as human beings compared to what mm -hmm. Israel's right. ancient Near Eastern right. neighbors thought like we were just slaves, the gods, the gods depended on right. us as, uh, you know, indentured and in indentured servitude right. to them. And, you know, right. Israel has a very different picture of what their relationship to God is like. So the biblical flood account is saying, here you are, folks, this is how you ought to think about the flood. This is what God was doing and why he was doing it. So it's really not about the event but rather what the event meant. So their description of the event is not intended for you to try to reconstruct it hydrologically and geologically <laughs> and scientifically. That's not its purpose. Its purpose is so that you understand it theologically. Okay, so some people say, well, it must mean a global flood because it uses all this universalistic language, the end of chapter seven, all the world under all the heavens and no one was left there, uses all this universalistic language. Well, certainly that's, you may think about reading that universalistic language as we've talked about the word literally, but we have to ask the question, are there other alternatives? Is it possible that the Bible could use universalistic language rhetorically. I mean, if we want to have all the possibilities on the table, we have to ask the question. Or the world that's most relevant to the audience, too, right? Yeah. yeah. So we start looking through the Bible and saying, do we ever have universalistic language used rhetorically? And you find out that, yes, it happens quite often, especially in cataclysmic conditions. So. Uh, all the world came to Joseph for food. Really? Every single human individual on the planet <laughs> came to Joseph? The, the Native Americans made it across the ocean and the Australian Aborigines got across? You know, wow! 
And he must have been a busy guy talking to all of them because they all came to him. You see, even those people who are very committed to reading the text literally wouldn't even think of those options. They'd say, of course, this is rhetorical. Oh, yeah. And you read places like Lamentations 2, Zephaniah 1, where both of them talk about the exile as total destruction of humans and animals and plants and everything, and no one was left. And you say, but wait, this is the exile. There were, there were people left. <laughs> we yeah. know they went into exile. Yeah. And, yeah. And, somebody, you know. and so again, you see examples. This is a cataclysmic event, the exile. So they use universalistic language, but it's rhetorical. The Bible can do this. Its literal meaning is rhetorical. Mm. Okay? And we know they intended that. Now, you still have to say, but wait a minute, in Genesis 7, is that is the literal reading rhetorical? Well, that's something that people have to decide. But at this point, this is how I go with this. At this point, you can say, uh, I've got evidence that suggests it could be, that the literal meaning could indeed be rhetorical. If that is an option on the table, then I cannot claim, even if it's just an option, regardless of how you decide, if it is an option on the table, then I cannot claim that the Bible absolutely demands a global flood. No, no, you can't say it demands it because this could be rhetorical. Okay? And so in that sense, you can't talk about the Bible's demands. You can only talk about one of the possible readings of the Bible as requiring a global flood. And at that point, you start evaluating both literarily and even historically, does that work out? You know? Right, because then I'm not left with the option of going, you know, I was an ancient history guy. There are roughly, if we were to, you know, just take the genealogies as some people do and try to approximate a kind of timeline for Noah's flood. I mean, there's still civilizations that we have historical evidence for. Right. And I, I can't discount that right. um, without jump, jumping into some sort of massive conspiracy theory about, you know, what the Smithsonian is secretly hiding from us in their basement and all, the, all these other things. I, I just, I can't. I can't, I can't do it. And if the text isn't demanding, you know, because I think people really earnestly are trying to follow Jesus. They know that following Jesus means the way we follow Jesus is we, we take the scriptures that he, he himself followed, right? And we take the, the, the New Testament text that bears witness to his life, death, and resurrection, and that's authoritative in our life. So they really feel conflicted when they're like, you know, Dr. Walton, I'm sitting in your class, and I, I really, really want to believe the Bible is authoritative, inspired, and infallible in my life, but I also just went to the History Museum, and I don't know what to do. And what you're saying, if I'm understanding correctly, is that Noah, the story of Noah in Genesis 6 and 7 is not placing a demand on us that would require we throw out all of the overwhelming evidence that not just geologically, but archaeologically, historically, um, there wasn't a global catastrophe at that point. Right. And the Bible doesn't demand it. So again, we get to the question of, are there competing truth claims? And I, over and over again, I come out with the conclusion, no, they're, they're not making the same kinds of claims at all. That doesn't mean that there was no flood. Mm. It just says we can't reconstruct the scope of it. Massive, cataclysmic, absolutely. But global, well, that's another, that's another thing. Okay, so again, we need to stop trying to reconstruct these things apologetically and trying to understand them theologically. Because the Bible isn't intending to give us the information we would need to reconstruct them scientifically. Well, I'd like to just pose one last question, and maybe it's actually more of a pastoral question. I know you're not a, a pastor by trade, but mm -hmm. I imagine you get these sorts of questions in your classroom. 
Let's say someone's listening to this, although lots of listeners are familiar with your work, regular listeners, there might be somebody tuning in that goes, hey, this is the first time I'm hearing of some of these concepts. And Paul and John, I'm, I'm a little bit worried that if I've been reading my Bible wrong for so long in this way, golly, should I, I feel like maybe, maybe I just throw the thing out. Maybe I, sh- maybe I shouldn't even read it at all if I could read it so poorly. What sorts of words of encouragement would you offer someone that might be feeling like, golly, did I get it all wrong? This feels overwhelming. I don't know where to begin. Help us out, Professor Walton. (laughs) Every interpreter in the history of the world has made serious mistakes, myself included. We just don't know what they are. (laughs) The fact that we are imperfect interpreters doesn't mean that the Bible is no good to us. Uh, On one hand, I can say that Even in our misinterpretation, God can um, use our reading of Scripture to bring us closer to Him. Uh, Furthermore, the basics of theology are not up for grabs. The Bible is very clear on the basics of the gospel, on Jesus and who He is and what He did. And those things are not really up for grabs. They're not under revision here. And so to that extent, it's not like we have to throw out the whole thing. At the same time, we recognize that there's always more to learn. The the process of doing interpretation, or what we might call exegesis, um, involves the constant refining of our methodologies, the constant learning of new information. And we work with the best that we've got. You know, some people have a lot of information and they're accountable to to use that. Others don't have a lot and just work with what you've got and try to learn more as you can. Uh, But that, you know, it doesn't mean that we can't read the Bible profitably unless we've got a PhD in ancient Near Eastern studies in Hebrew or something. Um, You know, I believe that Bible reading and interpretation is a community process. And each person in the community has contributions to make, insights, questions um, that that can be helpful. Um, People who have training have a certain kind of contribution they can make to that process. But I don't want to just count on my training or even the scholarly world and not benefit from insights that people have who have no training. Uh, So in that sense, we have to recognize that we're engaged in a community process, which is growing and learning all the time. We can't say, oh, those people back in the third century or 12th century didn't have this information. Why would God leave them like that? And have they been wrong all the time? Don't worry about it. We now have what we now have, and we do our best with it. We stand on their shoulders, but yet we have information that goes beyond what they could have done. And if they had that information, they would have used it. So don't say, well, I'm not going to use ancient Near East because Calvin didn't have it or Augustine didn't have it. They would have loved to have it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, we keep working with what we have. Um, We're we're responsible uh, based on what God has given us. And so, no, don't throw it away. Um, Just keep trying to learn. Now, for ancient Near East, they're, they're... are sources available now that weren't available a generation ago that can help us understand these cultural backgrounds. Um, And I guess on your thing, you'll make reference to the Cultural Background Study Bible. Yep, that's uh, a great one. That really right there in your Bible gives notes that will help you understand the cultural background. So it's accessible. Um, And it's not too much more work to to go to those study notes and you know if something's valuable it's worth the work that's right that's right that's great encouragement and great advice uh i will link that specific resource that um dr walton has shared and as well as his other books uh, at least the ones most pertinent to today's discussion john thank you so much for your time i appreciate you uh, interrupting your sabbatical and your writing to take some time to have this conversation maybe again in the future we can we can have another conversation. I know there's lots of people with questions about Job and the the, the, the times I've referenced your specific scholarship in Job. So I'd, I'd love to have you on again in the future. 
Okay, Paul, it's been great talking with you. All right, thanks. And God bless everybody out there. <laughs>